it seems that the set of universes that con contain us has certain limitations. Right? Not every possible universe can contain us. The universe that con contain us is, must be essentially a controllable universe. From our perspective, it seems that, um, in some sense, um, atoms control elementary particles and molecules control atoms and uh, cells control molecules and organisms uh, control cells and um, societies control organisms and so on, right? So we look at a hierarchy of control. It's a one way of looking at the complexity that we're seeing. And a system that is being controlled, uh, that has, has some kind of control structure, uh, implies that the controller imp uh, implements a model of that what it is controlling, otherwise it couldn't control it. Right? If you can implement a model of something, it means that the model is discoverable, which means that the system is learnable. A controllable universe is a learnable universe. The non-controllable parts of the universe will look random to us. They're not controllable. But what we can see is largely controllable. Right? There are some zero-point fluctuations of the universe that we cannot control. We don't know uh, where they come from. We don't know how to influence them. And uh, the particles that we are looking at are those parts of the fluctuation that are regular enough to be described in some kind of good control model. It's tempting to think of um, the universe like uh, something like, say, the surface of an ocean that is in constant fluctuation. And these fluctuations look uh, random to something that is swimming on that surface. And uh, But on the surface, there are also regular patterns for some things like water vortices. And these water vortices need to have particular properties to be stable. And when they have these properties, they're almost indestructible. Uh, basically, there is a certain number of molecules that need to be uh, involved in a certain way or at a certain speed. And then suddenly you get a vortex that is so stable that it can only be broken up by hitting other vortices that have compatible or, or uh, properties that are in some relationship to that. Right? And uh, this is roughly, I think, a, a model of the particle dynamics that we're looking at. There are some patterns in, in the overall dynamics that are so stable that they can be described by control models and can be exploited by higher level control structures. So they give rise to complexity. And the ones that can't, we just don't observe them or we observe them as random or we observe them as noise? Yes, we, uh, they're not predictable, right? They, uh, in some sense, the meaning of information is its relationship to change in other information. So if you see a blip on your retina, the relationship of that blip to other blips of ret uh, on your retina is the meaning that this blip has. Right? This meaning uh, that you discover is a function that describes the relationship of blips on your retina to each other, to these different changes as, uh, for instance, people in a room that is lit and that the sun shines on and these people walk around, they exchange ideas and the room is three dimensional and so on and so on, right? This is the function that your brain discovers to describe all the blips on your retina. There are other blips on your retina that do not fit into this function and these blips are noise. And there's a lot of noise on our retina. And in some sense, this is also how we interpret the universe. Everything where we discover a relationship to the other things, uh, this is what we can model, and the rest is noise. And the amazing thing is that physics is uh, clarifying the universe to such a high degree, and there's so little noise left. Do you think that ultimately there will be no noise left, that we'll be able to characterize everything? I think that we will always be able to construct a function that uh, behaves as if there was no noise, that basically explains everything. But it doesn't mean that this function is necessarily predictive. It doesn't need to be the correct function. And uh, it's not the only function that can explain it. It's like, imagine you live in a computer program like Minecraft, and uh, you observe all the patterns around you. You can always construct a computer program that will work like Minecraft and will explain all the patterns around you, even the random patterns. Right? You can always come up with some pseudo-random number generator that produces this, but uh, you will not necessarily be able to discover the truth of the matter, except um, if the world that you live in is so simple that it suggests itself that there is only one simple function or a class of simple functions that can be uh, mapped onto each other with a simple uh, transformation that uh, gives the same result every time. Right? So imagine that you discover yet you live in a Mandelbrot fractal, the Mandelbrot fractal is like two lines of code. And uh, you can express these lines of code in many, many different ways. So the, many ways of expressing the same function, the same sequence, uh, but there are mappings between all of those. And uh, so if you discover the Mandelbrot fractal, you can basically say, this is the simplest function that explains it. This is the reality that you're looking at. This is a simple 
um, sequential um, definition of how to calculate these pixels on that plane. And it's conceivable that we would find such a function for our universe. But uh, if the universe is very complicated, we can still find a very complicated function. In some sense, the quest of physics is to find the shortest function. And the current function that we have that explains most stuff, not everything, but most, is the standard model. It's like half a page of code. And it's uh, it's already very short, but physicists keep hoping for something that is much shorter because half a page of code is still very complicated and people ask themselves where all, does all this complexity come from. Do you think that ultimately the code is short or do you think that, like Feynman was quoted saying that it might even be an onion where you just keep unveiling the layers and it's more and more complex, less and less complex, and it doesn't follow necessarily a pattern. Maybe there's not even a center. Do you believe there's a center and do you believe that center is simple? These are weird metaphors. It's mostly ways that we think about the world that we should deconstruct before we trust them, right? What does it mean that for something to be a center? It's inside of something and the onion is outside and it's spatially aligned. So uh, what this describes is probably a hierarchy of models. And uh, the question is, does every subsequent layer of modeling that we discover become simpler and simpler? Imagine you take a microscope and you look at uh, a cell and you zoom in and every, uh, at every level of resolution where you discover a new structure, the question is, does the structure become more simple or more complex? Right. And, and does the model converge to something ultimately? Yeah. And I think that uh, it's very likely that it does converge to something from what I understand, but I cannot make such a proof at this point. I think that it uh, must converge to something because there are no infinities. Things need to be constructed. There is also this uh, weird properties that, for instance, if you look at the particle generations, they uh, are integer fractions that describe uh, how, they are, uh, how they differ in their properties, right? So uh, it could be that there are uh, smallest building blocks of information that uh, make up the particles that we're looking at. There is no infinite division between them. And so it uh, could be that the, the causally closest lowest layer is somewhere uh, inside. It's something that we can still construct.